All right. We're going to go ahead and get started and obviously we're recording this to for everybody that will watch the recording. It is my honor to introduce to you a dear friend and a woman who I admire greatly for her just business savvy, her money savvy, and who I just love and respect as a human being who just um, I hold in the highest regards as far as integrity and ethics and uh, just really heart centered, especially in the money space. That goes with everyone, but then she's, uh, I think we know that in the financial industry, it's it's predominantly male. So I love that Kim is uh, brings the feminine financial power to the equation. Great men too, uh, but I, I do like to uh, just uh, give Kim those type of kudos for, uh, for a male dominated space for sure. So just as background, Kim and I have known each other for many, many years. She's spoken at many of my events. Uh, I work with Kim. I'd say a good portion of my network works with Kim. And she'll tell you about herself, of course. Kim is really, she's an expert in what we call alternative investments. And alternative basically means anything that's not stocks and bonds for, for the most part. But the reason why I want to bring on Kim, one is to introduce you to her because most everyone will probably want to set up a call with her after Curbs and uh, to start this conversation. And so it's an introduction. And then to open it up so you can to ask questions. But in the, I get asked all of the time, the number one question I get asked is, Christina, where do I invest my money? And like there's one shiny penny or there's the one place to invest. There's bazillions of places to invest. So it's less about um, the fact that there are many places to invest. It's more like, who do you know that you can trust as part of your network of financial health to help you make good financial decisions, which includes investing. And so Kim is my go-to person when I need help or have a question or want to invest my money in some of the things that she helps people invest with. She's my go-to person. Um, so she'll talk about some alternative investments and what that means. Usually the referrals go to Kim with something called whole life insurance. And whole life insurance is a... Uh, whole life itself is something that 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 gets naysayed a lot because many more traditional planners don't understand it and therefore it's not in kind of their suite of things that they're kind of paid to sell um so it gets it gets a bad name uh, but i'd say my wealthy friends who really understand uh, uh, they're investing and building a portfolio and just overall wealth. Whole life insurance is a piece of the puzzle. And so um, I encourage those that listen to my work to really um, to ask and to inquire about whole life, not necessarily believe what you might find on Google, and then ultimately just meet with Kim to see if this is something that might fit into their portfolio. But again, it's something totally misunderstood. So I'm gonna pass the mic to Kim. I just wanna set you up to really know that she's special and she's somebody that you wanna know. And part of when you start to, you know, after we complete curbs and we get our financial system working and we get our money working the way we want it to work, our next step ultimately is to, be, is to, to have a, an investor mindset, which means we need to understand that the way to build wealth is we have to put our money to work. And so that can be intimidating and scary. And so having the right financial team is really crucial. And the reason why kind of one of the things that differentiates those that have wealth and everybody else is less about the product and more about who you know that you can trust to help you make these decisions. So it's what I have that everybody else doesn't have is who I know and who I trust and who's in my corner. So um, I'll pass the mic over to Kim to introduce. So share a little bit about yourself, Kim, that I haven't talked about. And then 
uh, just talk, start talking about kind of investing 101 and start, I know you've got some things to talk about, but that where um, everybody listening can understand these next places to get started, the mindset around investing and uh, ways like ways to get started, to get over that fear of starting to make, start to invest your money. All right. Over to you, girlfriend. Uh, thank you so much, Christina. Always, always a joy to help people in your community because of who you are. And consequently, that makes them who they are. And we love that. We know, K-N-O-W, that mindset and how we're being is so, so important. And um, there's just a lot of learning of what not to do out there <laughs> in that space. So I heard that somebody put in an email that I owned alpacas. And so if you do not know about this animal, uh, we're going to talk about how an alpaca actually will help you learn about life insurance, which will be a little bit of fun. Uh, we're going to talk about how dairy cows, notice dairy cows, not beef cows. This is a Holstein, the black and white kind that you see that have milk, uh, also relate to both investing, which is a verb, and investments, which is the noun, the thing that we do. Um, and uh, these are, this is a real like super soft alpaca. This is an alpaca purse. If you don't have one of these, it's a must. Um, this is available on Etsy. I don't sell them, but somebody does. And um, I don't know where I got this, but these are the softest animals ever. And if you go to the barn, um, we have 16 of them and you, you reach out to pet them, they look soft. And then when you actually pet them, they are softer than they look. They're incredible. There's two kinds. This is Surrey and this is Wakaya. They're the more teddy bear kind that you see like on Instagram and such. So yeah, they're real and uh, we do have them and I'm very grateful. I live in Mount Enterprise, Texas, which is over on the east side. Uh, Shreveport, Louisiana is actually our closest city. So I help people all over the United States and I do work with alternatives. That word is just a great word because life insurance is an alternative for cash. The way that Christina and I think that you all have picked up on with your curbs training is definitely an alternative to the way a lot of the world thinks. Looking at investments, we can choose to either deal with what everybody else deals with, which is usually stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, or we can choose an alternative. And it's kind of like most things in life. If you look out at the landscape and you see the results that other people are getting and you want different results, then you'll want to look for alternatives, right? It, I mean, it's true across our health. It's true across our mindset. And it is absolutely true with our money. So uh, anything else that you, I've been doing it for over 30 years. I, I've worked out of my home since the internet began and it was like way not cool <laughs> to work out of my home. Um, and just for fun, my children, when they were in their early twenties, bought their own life insurance policies because they had been listening to their mother who worked from home every day when they would come home from school, they would go do their homework or whatever they were doing. And I would help people get involved in this space. And so they knew what to do when they were 22, 23, you know, getting out of the workforce, et cetera. So kind of some fun stories there, but is there anything else, Christina, that you think is important about the background or anything else that needs to be covered before I hit your investments 101? No, I don't think so. I think that's a, that's lays the background. And, and like I said, the, uh, where we are with curbs for many is they're getting their financials in order, getting to understand where all their money's going and understanding that the way to build wealth is to put the money work. But then there's that fear of like, all right, now what? And so take it from there, like the, the now what? Perfect. Perfect. So what I have always loved about Christina's curbs program is the buckets. And it's so, so important that we be very purposeful with our money. And just like a long time ago, we had to learn the difference between, for example, this is a Robert Kiyosaki saying, I can't afford it. 
and how can I afford it? We have to learn that we be purposeful. So we have to be purposeful with our language, which of course starts with our thinking. We have to be purposeful with the dollars. And it's very, very difficult to be purposeful with the dollars if you don't have a bucket with dollars in it for the purpose. So it almost doesn't matter. Is it a hundred bucks? Is it a hundred thousand? What matters is it's got a purpose and you know, you're going to build it. So I believe, and I, I will admit to you, I don't always get the name of the buckets right, but I'll try. I believe the most important one is that rainy day bucket or in your emergency fund dollars. And you hear about this all over the place. I believe that that number should get set very quickly, accomplished very quickly. For most people, it's fairly fast because then we can stop thinking about emergencies, right? We, we get what we focus on. And if we have that emergency fund, that rainy day fund handled, then we can stop thinking about it. And it's so freeing. People talk about financial freedom all the time. Well, one of the biggest ways to get financially free is to have an emergency fund. So for some families, that's 10 grand. Like, you know, if you're a 22 year old and your rent's a thousand a month, $10,000 is a perfectly acceptable emergency fund. For other families, it's a hundred grand. For Oprah Winfrey, she has publicly stated it's seven million dollars. Okay, fine. Like, get it, pick your number, get it funded. Every resource that you can, and I know you guys have your your percentages, which is awesome. I just really encourage every extra resource get that emergency fund funded, and then stop thinking about it. So, truly, for me, investment one hundred and one is that step first. Then the next step is we want to build for opportunities. Now you've got two or three buckets that play a role here. So the dream bucket is one of them, of course, your investment bucket is one of them, of course. And this is when I like to bring in the dairy cow. So let's just see in the chat box. Do you know what breed of cow this is? Let's see who's got their farm wisdom going. Put in the chat box if you know what breed of cow this is, because, uh, oh, this is fun. Brad, you are correct. It is a Holstein. Adelaide, jerseys are brown. So you did good. You answered the question, <laughs> but no, this is not a jersey. Jerseys are known for having a very high fat content, like the cream, and Holsteins are known for having large amounts of milk. So when I was growing up as a fourth grader, I was given a Holstein and my sister was given a Jersey and the two together got us what the best of both. Please write that down. The best of both. Every time we make investment decisions, we want to try to get both. Can we do this all the time? Heck no, <laughs> but we can try and we can't get there if we're not trying, if we're not looking for that. One of my mentors, Dan Sullivan has a great sentence and it is your eyes will only see and your ears will only hear what your brain is looking for. Your eyes will only see and your ears will only hear what your brain is looking for by Dan Sullivan. So in fourth grade, when I was given a milk cow and I learned to milk by hand, yes, these hands have milked many, many, many gallons of milk. We, my sister and I sold the milk. So my parents were teachers. This was not a full-time farm. This was a summertime and evenings farm, but guess what? Cows get milked twice a day. Why am I talking so much about dairy cows as it relates to investing? Because beef cattle, in order to provide their benefits, think dividends, think interest, have to die, right? You did know this. In order for us to eat the cow, the cow has to die. Regardless of your eating preferences, you still understand that concept. 
alpacas have the same issue. Many alpacas are shorn, right? They don't have to die for that. You can just shave off the fiber. It's not called wool. Wool is for sheep. Alpacas are called fiber because it's not wool. It is lanolin free and that makes it very hypoallergenic. And that's an important thing too, because in investing, we want to be as clean as possible. And what I mean by that is simple sometimes is really valuable. Straightforward sometimes is really valuable. Clean goes with that. Um, however, sometimes alpacas, unfortunately, see the leather on the back, do die, and then they get turned into products like this. However, when we're investing, and I will quit with the props here shortly, but they're kind of fun to keep us going. Um, when we're investing, we don't want the product that is producing the growth to die. We want it to stay, right? We want the dairy cow because that will enable us to own something that produces and continues to produce. And so thank you, Adelaide. I'm glad you like the visuals. With investments, so much of the investment landscape is focused on what's essentially a capital gain. I put X in, I get Y back. Ideally, Y is more than X. And then I have to do it again. I find another investment. I put X in. Ideally, I get Y back. And then I have to do it again and again and again. Now, sometimes we know that we put X in and, and we get Y back. Sometimes Y is our exact dollars. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes we put X in and we literally get zero back. This is the realm of investments. It pretty much doesn't matter what you're talking about. If the word investment is associated with it, especially investments that are capital gain oriented, in other words, put in a dollar and expect more back in the future, those types of investments can go to zero. And so this is where that concept of both is going to come back. As you progress forward, try always to do both things with your money. And what I mean by that is you're absolutely going to pursue investments. You're going to pursue capital gain oriented investments, and you're going to pursue dividend or cash flow oriented investments, i.e., you put money in and you get X, 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 X. So instead of money in and Y, X, X, X is indicating some type of dividend cash flow something happening all the time consistently. Now it may not go on the rest of your life, but investments that cash flow are like dairy cattle. Investments that are capital gain oriented are like beef cattle. Okay, that's the distinction. So back to this both, we wanna be focused if we can on investments that cash flow, the dairy cattle. And we also want to be with some of our money focused on things, I'll call them investments because we just use that language generically, but we want to be focused on things that absolutely positively are going to be there and have the G word associated with them, which is guaranteed. And typically you don't really get to put the investment word with the guaranteed word. Like those two words don't really technically go in the same sentence. And so if you have something that is guaranteed, it's generally more of like a savings vehicle, like whole life insurance or like an immediate annuity. We'll talk about both those as we progress here today. Whereas if you have an investment, whether it's cash flowing or capital gain oriented, you typically also have with it the risk of loss of money. Now, the term risk is used out in the marketplace a lot. And it's interesting because it's really gotten misdefined. 
risk does not mean the potential of hitting it out of the park. You hear the term more risk equals more reward. And we've taken that literally as if for sure, when I take on more risk, I am for sure going to get more reward. And that's not how it works. Risk is the propensity for loss. Like the definition of risk is the propensity for loss. And so we have to remember that. And as excited and awesome as investing can be, we just have to remember that it comes with the propensity for loss. And because of that, we want to do both. So we want to have some guarantees. And frankly, starting out, I think it should be about a 50-50 deal. Like again, after the emergency fund is funded and the rainy day fund is handled, the dollars that you have available to you in your dream bucket and your investing bucket, let's look at those with a 50-50 split. And that enables you to get both because if you'll identify some of it for investing, a verb, and you'll identify some of it as saving, a verb, saving is the act of putting money away on a consistent basis, which you guys do really well through your curbs process, then our saving dollars, 50% of those dollars being in the saving arena will be guaranteed never to be lost. And then our investing dollars, we can afford to take on the opportunity of risk, knowing that if we lose those dollars, it will be okay because we have the savings dollars saved. So saving is a verb, save, saves, savings is a noun. And so now we want to get into the question of where do we store that savings money? But before I do that, I want to pause. Uh, Christina, I assume you are happy for people to turn on microphones or pop questions in the chat box. Like let's, let's have some questions, make sure we're at the lay of the land and everybody's on the same page before I spend about 10 or 15 minutes on whole life insurance, the product to which I'm going to use Legos for my example today. Um, so questions, chat box, microphone on. Yeah. I mean, if you guys want to uh, put anything in the chat, when I think it goes without saying another thing I love about Kim is that how she simplifies all this in a way that we can all understand it, which takes, I'd say 90% of the intimidation factor off and understand kind of the big financial rig system out there is all about making it so complicated that you feel like you have to abdicate your money to them so they can manage it and charge you enormous amount of fees and, and all the things. And the more they make you feel dumb with money and inferior, the more that they can take your money. So I think what Kim is doing is really sharing with you the mindset and the understanding that this isn't complicated and we can all do it with some fundamental understanding of, of what saving and investing is. And again, some different places to move forward. So thank you, Kim. Yes, you're welcome. My mom was a kindergarten teacher. So picture this, two classes a day, 30 some kids each, public school, right? Taught kindergarten her entire career. And my sister and I would, as teenagers in conversations, mom, I am not a kindergartner. You do not need to explain it in such detail with such specificity and length. Like, I get it. You, you gave me the instructions. I don't need the kindergarten version, right? Nevertheless, sometimes the kindergarten version is the helpful version. So uh, my sweet mother, who has long since passed on, um, is, I'm sure, listening to my gratitude for her because I think it's why I explain things so simply is that's what works. So thank you for that. Okay, I'm going to just trust that you'll put questions in the chat box. I have it open. I can see it. I'm happy to uh, in intermix them in my conversations. So we're going to go on to a discussion about whole life insurance, and we're going to look at this little stack of Legos. So you notice at the bottom, I have black, and that's a foundation. 
and then it doesn't really matter the colors, but I, I have stories. Okay. So think about this, like a five story building. Um, technically, I guess you'd say four stories. So the foundation, right? The black one. And then I have story one, story two, story three, story four, as we're going up. This is going to be really instrumental in your understanding of whole life insurance, because as stated earlier, whole life is your savings component. Saving is a, a verb back to putting away money every month. And savings is a noun. Where do we store our savings, right? So whole life insurance is your cash equivalent. It is your alternative for savings. It's your alternative for liquidity. It is the space where you put your emergency slash opportunity money. So, you know, most emergencies start in just like a savings account. Awesome. Do that. Excuse me. And as you progress, especially if you have a bigger emergency fund, it's not fun storing that at a bank at two or 3% taxable. Furthermore, back to our Lego example, and you can't see the black real well. If, if we want to have more than a one story building, when we pour that foundation it's very important that we acknowledge that we want to build a two or four or 10 story building, right? The foundation for a 10 story building is very different than the foundation for a single story building. Whole life insurance is your foundation. And thankfully we are able to expand the foundation a little bit as we grow throughout our lives because if we're starting in our 20s or even 30s, we don't necessarily maybe know that we want a 10-story foundation called our personal finances. Sorry, a ten, sorry, a 10-story building. So we might not know how big we want that foundation to be built. Nevertheless, as we progress, we're able to strengthen and enlarge the foundation of our whole life insurance cash alternatives as we progress. And um, just by way of example, I own over 20 policies. Some of them are on my own life. Some of them are on my husband's life and he owns his. And some of them are on my adult children that were purchased when they were younger. And some of them are on key employees. So I save as a verb every month, sometimes annually into those policies I have a very strong and building, growing foundation. And with that, consequently, I can build assets up on top of that in the first, second, third, fourth, fifth story that do the cash flow job that I've explained, which guess what? Then just trickles down to feed the whole life insurance policies so that those get bigger so that I can borrow against them. And that's a subject we'll bunny rabbit trail on here in a minute to do more stories. And this is often described as the velocity of money or the movement of money through your assets. So the life insurance product, remember I talked about the, the both, I, Todd and I like to, Todd's my husband, we like to talk about we're in the house of both. We always try to do both. We try to get cash and investments with our money. We try to have cake and ice cream with our dessert. We try to, if there's a project around that we want to do and another project, we try to do both. Again, we can't always, but we try. We at least look for how can we do both. So whole life insurance is a centuries old product. So uh, Christina said it well when she introduced me. A lot of people tell me that they hate whole life. And I'm like, really? That's interesting. This is a product that is literally one of the very first financial products ever formed in the United States. It was actually formed in Europe first. And it's existed for literally a couple hundred years. And yet you hate it, or you think it's a scam, or you think it's a network marketing product, or you think it has high commissions and that insurance agents are horrible. And yet it's been around for 200 years. Like 
step back from that emotion, which I get, and think about that a little bit. So this very boring product, again, is an alternative for cash or your savings or your liquidity. It is designed to be fed on a consistent basis. You can buy whole life with a lump sum, but it really doesn't work very well that way. It's way, way better to take a hundred a month, a thousand a month, a hundred thousand a month, like whatever your zeros are and fund whole life on a consistent basis. Now you don't have to fund it for your whole life, yet you will want to own it for your whole life. Last time I checked, death was a guaranteed event. I guarantee you this one knows that. And because of that, we want to tie a guaranteed payment. So whole life is life insurance. It has a lump sum that it pays upon death. It's called a death benefit usually that is income tax-free. So most people, if you get out there on the internet, the ones that are speaking positively about whole life, yes, the larger part are speaking negatively about it, but we'll set that aside for now. The positive speakers are going to talk all about the cash value and the cash value is wonderful. And we're going to talk about it. And we're going to talk about borrowing against that cash value. That's what you're going to hear a lot about. And the fact is that there is still a death benefit and it's valuable. It's a great example, frankly, of getting both. You get an account for now and you get an account for later. Cash value is the proper name of the account for now. The death benefit is the proper name of the account for later. Now, just by way of quick explanation, whole life is not universal life, index universal life, variable universal life, or term life. All of those products have some value, but they are not what whole life insurance is. Whole life is your alternative for cash. Money goes in, money grows. In today's world, the dividend structure, in other words, the total growth of cash value is around 4%. And that is net, net, net. And I mean triple net when I say it. Many of you have real estate experience. You know what triple net means. For those of you that don't, it is after all the costs. It's after the cost of the commission to the agent. And I am a life insurance agent for just that fact. Licensed to help people in all 50 states. I earn commissions from the life insurance companies. I represent you, but nevertheless, I get paid by the companies. So net of commission, net of the cost of the death benefit. So when I say 4%, that's after you've already paid for the death benefit and after the cost of running the mutual company. Life insurance, whole life insurance is best, it's really only purchased from a mutual company. So think Guardian, Mass Mutual, New York Life, Penn Mutual, Northwestern Mutual, Security Mutual, Lafayette, Mutual Trust. These are the types of companies that sell whole life. If you're looking at Transamerica, John Hancock, Prudential, all of those companies are what are known as stock companies, and they do not sell whole life. So if you purchase whole life, you're going to put money in, it's going to grow at a nice 4%. Shabana Assurity, I'm guessing, is a stock company. I don't know that name for sure, but I believe that it is not a mutual company. Sometimes there's a thing called a mutual holding company, which is sort of a space in the middle. There's a chance that they're a mutual holding company. But if you have a piece of paper from a surety, just look for the words whole life or dividend paying whole life or participating whole life. Sometimes it's called because we participate in the dividends. Mutual companies are owned by us policyholders. They don't have public stock holders that own them. 
So if you're not sure, and if you have a piece of paper and you want to forward it, you're welcome to send it through Christina's team, or I'll put my email here in the chat box as we progress. You're welcome to email me the information. I'll be able to figure it out super fast. So um, the participating whole life or the dividend paying whole life grows, as I said, about 4% after the cost of the death benefit, the cost of commissions and the, and the cost of running the company. So then it builds this thing called cash value. And here's my email for you, prosperitythinkers.com. Cash value is your savings equivalent, your cash alternative, your emergency fund, your opportunity fund. And it can actually be a part of your dream bucket. It could be a part of your investing bucket, although probably not. And it can be a part of your rainy day fund bucket. That cash value grows without taxes. The cash value grows without taxes. So for a lot of us on the call, we're probably in those upper income tax brackets. That could be the equivalent of a six or 7% rate of return. When we add in the fact that we've got a death benefit, no taxation, and the fees have already been paid. So that's why people do sometimes call whole life insurance and investment. I mean, 7% return, that's not bad. Now, I will tell you personally that I don't call things an investment until we get into double digits. And that's my goal for investments. And I'm keeping an eye on our time here just so we get it's, we get done with the whole life and get to have some investment discussion as well. Nevertheless, not bad, right? And especially when you're first starting out, it's so, so important that you don't lose money. And the other thing that I find with whole life insurance, and I'm going to talk now about the borrowing against capability, is that the really, really good investments require lump sums, 50,000, 100,000, right? So we've got to have a way to build up to that number so that we can then fund the really good investments. And the really, really good investments require you to be accredited. And accredited requires that you have cash in fact, the, the most common rule that I see is you have to have $150,000 of liquid cash and you have to have your 50 or 100K or 250K or whatever the minimum is for the investment that you're trying to do separate. So the really alternative investments require us to be accredited. I know a lot of A words. And in order to do that, we usually have to have 150K cash. So whether you're in that space or not, building up that alternative for cash is very, very important. And of course, we want it to be as efficient as possible. So I'm just going to say one last thing about the borrowing against strategy. And uh, I'm going to give you a little acronym that will be helpful in the life insurance space. And then we'll do a little investing and then I'll be quiet and we'll have some Q&A. And um, Christina, I'm guessing you guys have a hard stop at the top of the hour. So I'll make sure that that happens. So here is my acronym to share around whole life that will help you understand how it works. And that is the word clue, C-L-U-E. So back to our little Lego foundation. C is for control. We want to control as many of these stories of the building as we can. C for control. L stands for liquidity. We need our foundation, this nice black Lego at the bottom to be liquid because with liquidity, we get peace of mind, financial freedom, the ability to solve emergencies and take advantage of opportunities. Liquidity, C, L, control, liquid, U stands for use. We want to be able to use or utilize our dollars. Just by quick comparison, you cannot use, use or utilize retirement dollars. Like I know you can invest in something in a self-directed IRA, but basically it's still under that box called an IRA that has a whole bunch of rules associated with it. 
We can't just do whatever we want with IRA money or any kind of retirement money. With life insurance cash value, we get to use or utilize it whatever way we want. And the last one, E stands for equity. So back to our building, we understand how real estate equity works. We have a building, we borrow against it, usually for what's called a mortgage. But we know that the bank doesn't come take the top floor, right? We still get the use of the whole building. Well, life insurance works the exact same way. You borrow against it, but it forms the function of equity, meaning you have your dollars growing inside the life insurance policy, while at the same time, they are borrowed against the cash value and they are out doing the job of what two things does the cash value do the job of solve emergencies and take advantage of opportunities cash values job is to solve emergencies and take advantage of opportunities and as stated hopefully the emergency job is is done quickly so that we can start to work on opportunities and you want to borrow against it because you can take it out but if you withdraw it it stops working for you. And all of us adults have experienced this our whole life. We have a savings account. We build it up. We take it back down again. We build it back up. We take it back down again. We build it up. We take it back down again as we solve emergencies and take advantage of opportunities. Well, what if every time you built it up, it just kept building. And when you borrowed against it, it just kept building because you didn't borrow from it. You didn't remove money from the cash value that are in the stories. You borrowed against it like equity and real estate. And when you borrow against cash value, it keeps on growing because it's in the policy. What you have is a loan from the life insurance company, a loan from the life insurance company against the cash value that is your stories of your building. Okay, just like equity. Again, the bank doesn't take a bedroom or a store or a floor, right? They just have a collateralized agreement against the equity in your real estate. Well, your life insurance is collateralizable and you can collateralize it at the insurance company. You can also collateralize it at a bank. So if you have any questions about that, I'm going to zip right along here. You're welcome to email me. Kim at prosperitythinkers.com. My favorite question to ask is how you learn best. If you'll tell me, I like to read, I like to watch, I like to listen. Then I will give you resources in one of those three modes. Or if you like to get your hands on things, if you're that kind of a learner, I actually even have a funny little card game that helps people learn a little bit. And that will enable you to get over that learning curve. And we always make better decisions when we feel confident about the information that we've assimilated ourselves, right? Christina said it well earlier. I'm not interested in you paying management fees for your money. I'm interested in learning in you learning how to manage your money yourself. Okay, so CLUE, C-L-U-E, Control Liquidity Use Equity. Now, switching gears to pick up the end of Investment 101. I just want to see a quick show of hands. Who does not know what an accredited investor definition is? Who does not know what an accredited investor definition is? Okay. So it's a million dollar net worth or not and, uh, I have to think, $300,000 of income if you are married. And now I'm really blanking on this. Christina, is it a, is it, it's 200,000 if you're single, I think. Is that right? Okay. So your income has to be 200,000 if you're single, 300,000 if you're married in order to be an accredited investor. And so if that answers those questions, great. If not, keep your hands up or turn your microphone on or, or just holler at me. Shabana, thank you also for saying. So accredited investor. So this is a, either you are or you aren't. If you're not, this is a goal. And who knows, that could take quite some time or maybe it happens super fast. It depends on your curbs implementation capability, which is largely a function of your income anyway, right? And your savings habits and the good habits that curbs helps you develop with your buckets. So Gabrielle, if you have a question, either pop it in or turn your microphone on, I'm happy to help. Yeah. 
Nope. Good. Okay. Beautiful. So the investment steps that I recommend are to try to seek things with cash flow, right? This is not easy. The best, simplest approach is to find real estate syndications. Now, I'm not affiliated or associated with any of these. This is just purely educational information. Real estate syndications are the type of passive real estate that everybody dreams about, which is basically you put your money in and you get your milk, your dividends, your cash flow, right? Every month or every quarter or every year, however it is that they're paying. So what I love about the investment space is that if you don't have dollars to work with yet, because you're just starting to get your buckets funded and et cetera, you have your brain to work with. So go into learning mode, right? And as you're building the dollars, build the education. So let's just make it a note to look up things like accredited investor, real estate syndications, cash flowing deals, cash flowing real estate, cash flowing investments. A simple one could be to buy a stock that kicks off a dividend, something like IBM or Coca-Cola, you know, these ancient stocks that kick off dividends. I mean, that's cash flow. That, that would count as a dairy cow, if you will. But if, again, if you're looking for this kind of thing, you're going to find it. If you're not looking for it, you're not going to find it. And so this alternative approach is to seek cash flow, not capital gain. To seek cash flow in the form of dividends or literal cash flow like real estate could be as simple as a single family home that you rent out, right? One of the things that I do for my clients is we have a real estate calculator and I'll take their facts about an individual real estate deal, like a single family home or a 30 unit apartment building or a 400 unit apartment building. It doesn't matter. And run it through the real estate calculator in order to help them understand the rate of return that the deal generates. Because frankly, most realtors are not able to give you that information. They can give you like cap information, but that's not the same cap CAP. It's a real estate term that they'll use to kind of compare one investment to another. It can do that in the real estate space, but it doesn't really give you the generating rate of return. Like my goal of double digits, for an example. So again, let's be looking for deals that cash flow. Let's be looking to learn. And I would encourage you to just start the way that you learn best. So if it's on YouTube, do your search. If it's on Amazon, you know, for books or what have you, do your search. If you get into the podcast space, do your search. And a quick thing I learned the other day, artificial intelligence is super close to enabling us to search podcasts so much easier, way, way better than we have the ability to right now which I am so looking forward to. There's so much good information in the podcast space and we should be able to, to search those soon. So I'm excited about that. So we've got about seven minutes left. I've pretty much done my part of the investment 101. Christina, add in, or maybe you have some questions or maybe other people have some questions about the whole life insurance or any of the alternative investment space. What would you like to head into next? Yeah. So to, if I heard you correctly, to sum that up, what you're saying is that, you know, the first place is the rainy day bucket to start saving and getting in the habit of saving and to, uh, you distinguish it between in saving as a verb, they're saving for the rainy day. And then they're saving for opportunity, which we'd call the investing bucket. And we need to work on both of these as we're growing our money and growing our, our financial security and wealth over time. And a place to start, in your opinion, is whole life because it it's almost for, it is forced savings where it's causing this forced savings because you have to pay your premium every year. You don't get a choice. It's not like other accounts where you could go dig in and, you know, um, so it's a great place to start. So to start the conversation there. Anybody, anybody that's listening that is interested in that, connect with Kim through email to start that process. And 
And my daughter, who is 26, she has her life insurance policy, and I'm going to work with them to create many policies over that and fund the kids and grandkids and whole life as a legacy building and a true financial strategy. It has so many benefits, especially for families. If if you um, you know really learn this, and it, it's not difficult to learn either. So Kim can coach you on that. So a great starting place to to start building towards those those two different buckets that can be under one umbrella of life insurance. And um, again, so many benefits that we can talk about um, directly. And then I think where, uh, and then investing obviously can be other places where we're looking at other types of investments. And to sum up what Kim is saying is that there's really two types of investments. There's capital gains, like she described in cash flow. And I buy for cash flow. That's that's what we're looking for. Cash flow, um, like I love the the milk cow analogy, but that's what we're working towards over time is to have those cash flowing assets that we earn our money, then we put a certain, we invest a certain amount to create cash flow that ultimately becomes our retirement, even though Kim and I don't like that word. Um, and that's a conversation for another day. So um Again, you just made it so easy to understand and, and make it such an approachable conversation, Kim. So thank you. I think the final thing maybe in the last couple of minutes is, I guess I think one of the biggest misconceptions, if that's the right word, when it comes to um, wealth and balance sheet and in the conversations I'm in every day and, you know, and, and the probably a thousand conversations I have a year is when I ask people what they have in investments, pretty much I'd say 95% of the time, those that have investments, it's like I have a 401k and they think maybe they're doing okay. So I guess um, clue, I love the acronym for clue as well, because you don't have control, liquidity, um, utility, or equity in these types of Kind of assets, but what would you say just to kind of again coach people on this belief that I'm financially secure in my future retirement because I've been doing a company match with my 401k? I use that clue acronym for everything. So you said it well. Just take those four terms: control, liquidity, use, and equity, and run whatever product you're thinking about through them. So quick on the 401k, can I control it? No. Is it liquid? No. Can I use it for whatever I want? No. Can I borrow against it? No, I can borrow from it. And then I pay it back with after-tax dollars. So four out of four, no. Is that really the space that you want to be? Now I get it. If you're getting a match, of course, you're going to put in money up to the match, M-A-T-C-H, but I really would not put money up to the max max in that environment. Awesome. Yeah, and it's just to it's just to know that there, you know, to and even I think a lot of people think because they have a 401k, they're going to have plenty of money in retirement and and when you run the numbers that's usually not the case. So, you know, really this is just an expansive mindset that maybe you have a little piece of a triangle that's towards traditional retirement on the pie chart and overall investments, but that would just be a piece of the pie. It's not the entire pie. So um, thank you, Kim. And if you guys have any final questions, but really reach out to her. What I love about Kim also is that no matter where you are in your journey, she's a great starting place, not because you have the money to invest with her right now, but she loves helping, getting you started, working mindset. Hey, here's things to do. Call me back in a year, but these are the things to do to to be able to call me back in a year and just to really, you know, um, put her in your corner as a resource. And remember what we're doing here is with curbs, the bucketing and everything that you're learning and applying, it's like Kim said, it's being, it's being intentional. It's learning to be intentional and purposeful with every dollar and to give those dollars a purpose. And it starts there. And then we're going to start to see these buckets grow and start to see that our financial situation's in a place that now we want to start putting our money to work and um, work with people that can help us do that. And again, Kim really is your first call when you're ready to go from you know point A to point B. All right, Kim, any final um, comments? 
Yes. I popped in the chat box. Convertible term insurance is your baby step. If you're not ready for whole life, convertible term insurance is a perfect baby step. This is something that I help people with. It is different than cheap term on the web, which is fine as well. Sometimes I will have people get both and there's long reasons for why, but um, you all are so welcome. I loved this. I adore email. Please do not hesitate to use my email that is given to you as a favor to Christina and her Curbs organization. And so I am happy to just email back and forth a little bit. And of course, I'm happy to schedule some talk time with you all. Awesome. Kim, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Grateful for you. And again, Kim comes into our Curbs network and just does these to help and and just really out of friendship and and um, all that good stuff. So again, thanks again. I, I love you so much, Kim. Appreciate it. Everybody connect with her and we will see you all soon. Enjoy. Thank you, Kim. You're very welcome.